Thanks for coming to uh, our talk. I'm uh, Cote. You are? I'm, I'm Rick, right? I'm Rick. That's right. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so far. Uh, so we're, we're going to give a little talk. So Rick and I have been working on uh, a couple of ideas about how, um, back in my day, as we used to call it, business IT alignment, when I worked on ITEL things, uh, if you know what that is. I'm going to leave right after this talk. So if you need me to apologize to you, I apologize. <laughs> I won't be here. Uh, but uh, I think what, in, in, so we both work at Pivotal, and what we often encounter is, uh, you know, all this, all this spring stuff and Kubernetes and uh, doing software well is really awesome, and we enjoy it. And then there's this whole other part of the, the organization, the business, and uh, they don't seem to be, like, uh, receptive to helping us improve. So uh, hence the title of this, like, what I've been thinking of is, is this is another, like, bottleneck that we have uh, to kind of crash on through. And I think uh, what, what Rick and I are going to go over here is not so much um, IT sort of bottleneck stuff, but how, if you look at the rest of the organization, as I kind of recklessly call it, the business, uh, what it is they uh, could be doing to make the whole overall software process better, how they can start kind of picking up their part of the process once uh, we in IT get really good at uh, doing software. And make the whole business better. That's right. Yes. And make the whole organization better. That's, that's, that's the goal as well. Instead of, I guess I was thinking more like, you know, if you do a lot of work to improve your software process and you're all happy, and then you're like, oh, and no one cares. It's kind of <laughs> depressing. Uh, but we have a good referral program at Pivotal. Uh, so if you're depressed about that, you should talk to me <laughs> afterwards. I will be here for that. The thing is, you have to work 90 days for Pivotal. So on day 91, you can leave. I don't care. <laughs> but stick with us 90 days. And you have uh, come to a, a couple of techies doing a business talk at a technical conference. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, any of you, for coming. Um, <laughs> and he already said Kubernetes, so now we are cloud native right. compliant. So we don't have to say it again. We were joking <laughs> that we should have that. We should have had that in the title. So just to kind of level set a little bit more, and also have an excuse to use this awesome clip art that that I licensed. <laughs> there were some better ones, but it had like a sun, and I wasn't sure if the characters would show up well. Uh, but you can. If you get these slides, you can get a link, see all sorts of great stuff. If you search for 80s, I'll, I'll get to the presentation soon. <laughs> but if you search for 80s vector art, that's what you're going to find. Uh, anyways, so uh, I think just to kind of introduce the, the thing and also to kind of see, get you to think a little bit about how business people start to think about this stuff. So really, like the reason there's this need to engage the business side in improving how they're working with software is it really is the case. Uh, I can easily make this into a word salad. But there's all sorts of new technologies from just faster internet to you know, mobile that people have. But I think more importantly, as, as you all know, the ability to actually get software out quickly and start to improve it by, by looking at how people use that software. This really means that as an, the rest of the organization of business, you have the chance to really think about programming your business and changing it, maybe not on a weekly basis, but just by adding features in the software to actually fundamentally change how you go about doing business. And I think, uh, like we both live in Amsterdam uh, now, because yes. we're lucky, <laughs> but uh, there's a whole host of things that, that you can get there that I think are a good example of that. That we can get in Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, as far as far as like, I was I was just thinking. My wife is there, and uh, you know, it's it's easy to like order everything through through uh, through your phone, which is just a simple example of like getting groceries or getting your food or whatever. And I mean, that's something that seems really normal, but to to specify it, I mean, like the idea when I was much younger that I could like you know order pizza uh, through my phone because my kids were hungry and I didn't remember to buy enough uh, as they call it minced meat to make the <laughs> pasta that they would uh, you know eat. But then it's easier to have this come there, right? Like all of that is fueled by work that y'all do, right? By having a good software function, but equally importantly, by having the business side like know what to do with that or or care. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. exactly. So. Uh, to, to that end, um, I, think, I think getting into it a little bit, right? So this, this, I think, is to grossly simplify it, or that's a weird way of putting it, to nicely simplify it. Um, this is kind of the end goal that organizations like this and, and uh, places that, that, that Rick has had experience firsthand in, uh, in the past that they get to is what we'll call a product team, right? And a product team uh, essentially is focused on that business that they're doing, making sure I can get pizza. And they have uh, a nice staff there. They also have, as I always like to joke, lots of pale wood. So make sure you have pale wood, not dark wood. Um, 
But getting to this point of as an organization is what IT can do, that if you have this team that can deliver very frequently and improve the way they do their software by studying it on a weekly basis. So you guys might be thinking, oh, well, we already have product teams. What, what's the difference? Well, when we talk about product teams, what we mean are cross-discipline teams that contain, among others, um, business, technology, HR, finance, people that might not be in your cur current product teams. Um, every member of the product team is accountable. They're empowered with the authority to make the product succeed or to help it succeed, and they're rewarded for the success of, of the project and the product. Yeah, and, and another way of thinking about it when, when Rick and I uh, go, go, are kind of working on this concept is they, to some extent, are the business. And to say the is a little weird, but they have ownership of their part of the business, right? So they're dedicated to that, I'll keep using the pizza thing, until we come up with a better <laughs> thing, to that, that pizza ordering app. And they're not only sort of being told features to put in or, uh, you know, um, like SLAs that they need to meet, but more of what they focus on is like, how can we make sure that Cote's kids get pizza on time, right? So their interest is not just the technology they're working on, but that business that they're doing and thinking about how they improve that. And over time, they start to um, uh, use metrics that are more associated with that. I guess mean time to pizza eating maybe is, <laughs> is what they would have. Um, but they also tend to focus on having that long-term knowledge of what the business is. And I think, I think, so again, going back to the framing that we have here, what we're interested in, the issue that, that these teams theoretically and we start to see these teams having is if they own that and then they go back to the rest of the organization to integrate in it and the rest of the organization doesn't really care, then that creates a problem, right? Like a bottleneck for the, the goodness, so to speak, of these, these teams extending. Now, I'm going to give you an example of what I think the happy path looks like when you do set things up well. With, well you know, I've, I've talked with people uh, at the Home Depot uh, for quite some time, and uh, of course, very valued, friendly, pivotal customer. I, I tend to only use you know, pivotal customers in my examples because I work at Pivotal, so pardon that. I'm sure you can find other people who have made poor decisions about the software they want to run who also have good stories, maybe. But anyways, I, I want to give you uh, a, a, an example of what it looks like when you have that product team who is really close to the business. And in this instance, being close to the business means understanding what their customers do, like how they go through selecting what they want and interacting, uh, transacting with, with the organization. Um, and that is, uh, this, this is one scenario uh, from one of the e-commerce teams, and that is, um, this is great. Usually I present this to Europeans and I have to explain what Home, Home Depot, Depot and all of this. <laughs> and I won't be able to make my toilet jokes, you'll see, but that's, that's fine. Um, but, you know, when you go to look to buy a washing machine, um, and I've been through this many times, right? Like, uh, you spend a lot of time researching online, trying to figure out, like, because washing machine, the differentiation between them is annoyingly small enough that you have to spend a lot of time to figure out what actually is different and uh, what, what the differences are. So you do all of this research. And then what the team found, so there was a product team, and they would actually like talk with people who were going through this and observe what they were doing. And what they found is people would do a tremendous amount of research and they would be ready to purchase, but they just wanted to go in store and kind of just like touch and feel the washing machine. And then also like no one really trusts the dimensions on there, so you want to go measure it yourself to make sure it fits into that little slot that you have. Um, but the problem would be they would go to their, their, uh, their local uh, the Home Depot, uh, and uh, they would find that the washing machine sometimes wasn't there, which is terrible because, you know, anyone who sells stuff knows that you want to sell the thing to the person when they're ready to buy. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to have to convince them again to buy it. Or even worse, now, now no whatever, but, you know, like a lot of retail stores who have basically one competitor, their one competitor, and I'll be polite and not really name them, typically <laughs> is right across the street or very nearby, right? So if you've done all this research, you're ready to buy, they don't have it, you're like, well, I guess I'm gonna go to that other place. And then if they have it, you know, maybe it's terrible because you're gonna compromise your feature set because of course there's different SKUs, but anyways. So that whole situation is, uh, I think the technical term is really not cool uh, <laughs> that they're missing out on that. So the team studied this and, and, and it seems obvious like all these things, but because this was a product team that was very business focused, right? And studying what was happening, they figured out, all right, well, obviously what we should do is add a little thing that says, tell me where this is, right? Guarantee me in so much as I can that today I can go find that washing machine in the store and transact and buy it if my tape measure shows that it actually <laughs> is the right dimensions. 
Um, and as you can imagine, that results in more sales. And, and typically, in a, uh, a company, especially that's public, we can all agree that more sales are good. Uh, so that, that worked out well. Now, the other, the other thing I was alluding to, I, I, always, I remember in studying this and listening to interviews, my, my favorite part of it was that also another thing they found, and again, this is a ridiculous example, but it shows the involvement that a product team has, is that usually, and I'm guilty, I'm not guilty, I fully admit to this, one of the first things people want to do when they go uh, into a Home Depot or a large store is, you know, uh, it's probably 10 a.m. in the morning and you've had a pot of coffee uh, and maybe a few breakfast tacos, and so you need to find, as we would call it here, I, I always forget this, the restroom or, or the <laughs> bathroom. And if you've been in one of these stores, uh, it's not always easy to know where they are. And so you spend a lot of time hunting around and looking for it. So the team discovered in talking with users that people wanted this. So very prominently in that in-store app, it will show you where, as we would say in Europe, the toilet is. Uh, which, again, it sounds ridiculous, but it's, a, it's representative of this focus on the end user, like actually being very business-centric and thinking about how do, we make our, how do we make people, customers, users, their lives better so that the business runs better. And I think th these, you know, you see examples like this uh, across all sorts of places. But obviously, making it so that you can find the toilet doesn't directly result in, in results like this. But this gives you a sense of when you take on this, when you remove this bottleneck of focusing on the full process of how you're running and programming your business with software. It makes it a lot easier to get to much better business results. And I think this is also a good, uh, it's good to show this into, at a technical conference, because these are, an example of the kind of, of metrics and the ways of measuring yourselves on the tech side that business people uh, respond uh, much better to and kind of understand versus our traditional uh, metrics of, of things going on. So now we'll get to the meteor part uh, of, of things. And I just want to lay out the case uh, that there is there is some kind of bottleneck between IT and the business. And this is, uh, I used to be an analyst so if I don't have charts in my presentation, I know it looks like I'm handling things really well, but that's because I have a chart. So it really <laughs> calms me down to have some bar graphs to look at. Um, but this is uh, from a Forrester survey. And it's basically, I spend way too much time looking up things of, like digital transformation and how organizations are changing. And what I picked this one out because what I find interesting about it is it shows, uh, based on their survey, I forget how many people are in it, but significant enough that it's not complete nonsense. Uh, but it's their answers of what part of your organization are you transforming? And what you'll notice is that in IT, lots, there's lots of transformation going on, uh, lots of stuff happening. I don't know exactly what's in there, but I'm going to assume it's great. Um, and then, as you would expect, right, customer service with call centers and handling, handling working with customers, that typically has a fair amount of IT involved in it. And also, uh, I'm just wildly speculating here. Also, there's a huge amount of projects that I come across that are going that are actual digital transformation from phones, like phone customer service, to actually mediating things through apps. So that's another big, gigantic area to chew through. But anyways, pretty quickly, you can see as you go to the rest of the organization, it starts to drop off, right? So it's not so much that these other parts aren't like figuring out how to uh, run Kubernetes or do their software differently. I mean, that's what happens in IT. But more of what I'm focused on is, so the, the processes that the rest of the organization follows, are they transforming those, right? Because if we're changing how you can use IT, how you can write your software, that would imply that the rest of the organization would change how they do their daily business, right? Like, if you can discover two weeks ago that it's really important to be able to find toilets, and then you go to, like, the, uh, the plumbing supply head of business in, in, in your organization, like, and you tell them that, and they're probably going to be like, I, what do you want me to do with that? I, I have no idea. I don't even know how to get you on my uh, schedule to meet with you, to talk about, like, or even, you wouldn't do anything with the toilets, but the washing machine buying thing, right? Like, I, I don't know what, how I'm going to respond to that or change the process around. So anyways, I think, I think that's something that, that Rick and I have, have started to, to note that results in uh, this, this lovely mismatch. Yeah, yeah. So um, historically, IT has always been a cost center, right? It ran back-end systems such as HR or accounting. Technology was not the primary communication method or channel for customers. It was something that could be easily outsourced, and it was often the target of cost reduction. Um, today, things are radically different. Uh, companies know the value of technology, or they should, if they still exist. Um, it's often a key product. If not, it's probably the, already the primary channel for customer communication. Um, a good example is going to a movie. So years ago, 
not that many years ago, I used to figure out where a movie was playing and I'd go there about an hour early if it was, had just come out to make sure I got a seat. Um, that was hit or miss because everyone does that, right? Everyone, everyone went and went there early. Now I would never go to a movie unless I used their app, picked my seat, and I get there 10 minutes before it starts. And if their app doesn't work, I go to a different theater. I see a different movie. So now it went from being something that was sort of on the side running back in systems to if this doesn't work, we could cease to exist. So it's, it's very, very important. But things haven't changed that much from, from the way they were, the way we treat IT. So despite the major changes to the importance of technologies, most companies have not adjusted their culture or their organization. They are completely misaligned. And, and again, the, the emphasis that we're, we're focusing on here is not so much in the IT world, but the rest of the organization. Yeah, right? you, guys, you guys got it. We're, we're, <laughs> you guys got it. You guys know what to do. See, Kubernetes, I said it again. <laughs> <laughs> so so what we, what we want to do uh, next is look through, we've kind of picked three things out of, I don't know how many, but I think, I think at the moment they're the three most important areas of misalignment, if you will, those pipes not lining up. Uh, and kind of discuss what the problem is and kind of how it c creates problems with improving the way the organization works as a whole. But also, uh, I don't know, hopefully offer, if not, uh, not, not easy to understand and put in place solutions, some sort of um, nudges of ways to start addressing it. Because some of these, they're really hard to fix and it's situation per, organ per organization. But I think there are some ideas that are starting to be proven to kind of fix these, uh, these misalignments that we have. Um, so, first, I think the first area um, that, and definitely if you look through surveys, you see this come up over and over again, that funding models haven't changed, working with finance is difficult, basically money is really difficult, right? And so, typically in an organization, to be, if you'll pardon some pedantry here, like, you know, finance is its own part of the organization, like very detached from, uh, I don't mean to be putting down finance people. I've worked with many great finance people when I was in strategy. And actually, if you, if you can just like remove that nerd part of your brain and like figure out they operate with complex, bizarre, fun systems, it's really fun to like work with them and see how they do things. Anyways, however, let me go back to my other tone in treating finance. So typically, they're like this separate part of the organization. And their responsibility is to make sure that money is not wasted, uh, right? That it's spent responsibly. And there's a whole host of other uh, compliance yeah. and things that they I have mean, as well. They're, they're often, especially in the United States, they're a third silo separate from business that goes up to the, to the CFO. Um, they work on completely artificial timelines, right? So they do these fiscal years, which has nothing to do with business cycles. It has nothing to do with product life cycles. It's completely separate. So it has nothing to do with what the rest of the organization is doing and they speak a completely different language th than we do. They're not really enemies to anyone in these silos. Like, quite often the business team and the tech technology teams don't get along. Finance is just off there. They're like the dentist. You, you have to go there. You don't really like what they tell you to do, but if you don't, it's way worse. So that's, that's how I see finance. Culturally, um, they view each cycle also as completely new with little connection to previous or future uh, financial cycles. So it's completely different than any way any of the other company parts of the company views the yeah the cycle and, and, and I think I think to to call it out specifically right so the one of the main mismatches just by numbers wise is a finance a financial cycle is typically like 12 months right and and if you imagine those product team cycles that we were just talking about right there let's say a week at the fastest I mean you can do daily deploys and that's great you know you're fan good for you but like a week a week at the best for most uh, mere mortals but also, you know, maybe two to four weeks where you're doing a release cycle. Now, you're not just, if you go back to the, the kind of examples, whether it's pizza or washing machines or toilets, right? Like, you're not just deploying code that's been uh, verified, QA'd to run that matches what you were told, but you're actually verifying business ideas, right? Like, if we change the way we run the business this way, it works or doesn't work. And if you think about, let's say, let's be uh, conservative and say on a monthly cycle. So... Mm -hmm. If your business is changing potentially on a monthly cycle or every, every month, or if you have new opportunities to grow your business, or the negative side is there's things that you should shut down, right? And you know this every 30 days, but then basically you're working with pools of money in 12-month increments. Like there's all sorts of problems that are going to arise from that, right? 
And I think that is one of the main things that I see find the creating a, a problem with finance is you just miss this opportunity to line those, those well, cycles. How, how do they well. even measure success? If they're looking at one year and you're doing, you're doing right. quick MVPs, min, minimum viable pizza, because they haven't added the checks for the <laughs> toppings, right? So it's just cheese. Yeah, how yeah, do you yeah. know that that works in, in the 30 days that you've done that, right? That, it's, that is part of the misalignment. They, they're not actually looking at the right indicators at the right time. Exactly. And so this is one area where I think there is there actually is some interesting work that's been going on that comes up frequently that's a little a little helpful. Well, hopefully a lot helpful. But um, I mean, it's a bit obvious in that, well, you know, hey, thanks, Cote and Rick. What you're probably telling me how to fix that is to not do that, right? A, a classic uh, fix to a problem. However, there are examples. Of, this is an example. It's a, a little old now from 2016, but it's from Allianz. So a large, a very, very large German insurance company. So I don't know if you ever talk with insurance people, but they're not really cool with risk. That's sort <laughs> of like not their thing. Um, and yet they have been able to put in place, and many other people have this process as well, where they realize this mismatch of things. And again, I think the focus for them and other people who get really good at this is not so much a mismatch of responsible spending. It's a mismatch of losing out on opportunities to invest that money more wisely, right? And so as, as we were kind of alluding to, one of the things you miss from this cycle from finance's perspective is if you're following an MVP process, right, of what's an idea, let's figure out how we validate this idea that this is, this is a, a good investment, right? Then let's either spend more on it or spend less with it based on if it's a good idea or not. And if you think about it, that's a huge amount of valuable information that finance could have when they're thinking about responsibly investing their money that they just cut themselves off from. And so instead, what logically makes sense is that you would try to reduce down that cycle. I mean, this is what we learned from small batch processes and MVPs. And the smaller the batch you have, there's probably some diminishing return. But the smaller the batch you have, the more feedback you'll get, which means the more intelligence you'll have about making good decisions. And so here, at, at, the, at least at the time they were presenting this at Allianz and other places, they have put in place a 90-day cycle, uh, basically an MVP cycle, to start up new businesses and do business ideas. Um, and at the beginning, there is, it's, it's almost like a reduced annual cycle down to 90 days because it's, like, it's not like they stop doing responsible planning and they're just like, I don't know, go code some stuff and have fun. Um, but they come up with an idea of what to do and they kind of pitch it to the, the, the group of people that is going to be overseeing it. And then they're given 90 days of funding and they go through the MVP process. Uh, and, and basically validate if it was a good idea, how it worked out. They kind of explore what the business is. And at the end of that 90 days, they meet again with the board of people and a decision is made to continue doing this, to stop doing it, to change what the focus is. But for finance, it gives them a very rich source of information about how wisely they're investing that money. And it not only gives finance a, more tools and more ability to do their job, but it also allows those product teams to not be stymied by finance, essentially. So um, this kind of, it's not the only way to address that, but this kind of thing is actually done. Um, and it seems to uh, drive pretty nice results and help remove that bottleneck to some extent. And um, have I missed anything yet? Not that I'm aware of. I, I think the, the other thing that I always lose off of this, because we get excited about finance, but <laughs> yeah, I had, we had strategy up there. And strategies on, I used to work in strategy, strategies on a very similar uh, misalignment, right? Um, and if, if you're familiar with what strategy groups do, they typically are trying to say, what should we do next year? Like, what, should we, what direction should we move the business and the company? What should we stop doing? They have the same sort of structural benefits they could have from a smaller cycle, where they actually could start to validate and think about, are our ideas real? Or is it just like something we made up after a bad burrito one day? Like, so they can get more information instead of being on an annual cycle than on, um, uh, anyways, they can get richer <laughs> feedback into what they're doing. So next, this is, this is uh, in working with this, this is one that, that Rick thankfully like uh, emphasized many times, even though I was just nodding along, pretending like I was listening. But I think he's come upon a really critical and crucial uh, misalignment here. Yeah, this is the, this is the part of the uh, presentation where I rant for a long time. And I have notes <laughs> so that I don't rant too long because this is, so... We've already said that technology is essential to the survival of businesses, right? Um, however, most companies are still compensating technologists like it's not critical to the business, like it's something on the side. Um, they should be becoming tech companies so that they can survive, right? Because now it's important. They should know that. Um, they should, in tech companies out in the valley, or hopefully here in Austin, um, 
technologists are giving equity. They're paid very well. They're paid based on the success of the, the product and the business. Um, in, uh, in traditional companies, n not so much. So technologists are the ones that create the product now, and that needs to be recognized in how people are compensated. Um, the, the business is rewarded if the product is financially successful, right? Um, they should be. This should mean that the business wants to try new things, they want to open new markets, they want to generate revenue. The technologists are generally compensated based on resiliency, uptime, and sometimes, unfortunately, cost reduction. Um, those are opposing goals. So in order to drive new revenue and open new markets, you have to have change. In order to have stability and reliability in the old pre-cloud native days, that meant you try to limit change. So you end up with change windows. You, change, you can change something only every six months. There's 90 page documents. But so it's a mess. They have opposing goals. And that makes them really not like each other very much. There's significant problems between the te technology silos and the business silos. Um, product teams are supposed to be one team working together. And they should be compensated the same way for the success of the product. Um, so compensation is an interesting tool to use for cultural change, because if you change the incentives, you can change the behavior. And this is probably the biggest thing I see left out of transformation. So they, they want to transform. They, they agree, oh, yeah, we're going to put everyone on these combined teams, but we're still going to reward people differently and incentivize them differently. And you're driving behaviors that are going to cause your transformation to fail. So the solution is you don't take compensation off the table. Um, you have to think about it. You have to think about what are we doing to make sure these people that are developing our products and that are such a core part of our business now are being paid the same way, and we don't create cultural problems because we're rewarding them differently and actually in a substandard way. Um, don't be guided by the industry guidelines that the HR team gives you. Go out and find out what the people are really worth, and don't go with the status quo. You have to open this up, and you, everything has to be on the table. Nothing is sacrosanct in a transformation. Yeah, and I mean, just to highlight the, I think I think the 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 part that I really like about Rick's ideas here is um, that misalignment between who gets rewarded for success, right? Like mm -hmm. that on on the business side, if if you're doing all this great stuff and you can make it so you can buy the washer more, order the pizza, like essentially on the IT side. You'll probably you might be given like in a traditional setting, kind of like one of those acrylic uh, chunks of, of fake glass saying that you did great. <laughs> and uh, maybe you get sent to a nice conference like this and that's fun. But then meanwhile, on the business side, they're probably like, great. Now I get tons more money because I, <laughs> I raised the revenue and directly affected like the numbers in the reports. I'm successfully doing this. And so you end up with this like I mean, one that's like philosophically a bummer. Uh, but like, it, it really is a misalignment of like, if you're going back to the, the product team and you're saying like, you should try harder and really focus on the customers and care. And here's another piece of acrylic, uh, you know, of, of a trophy for you. You got trophies because I didn't get trophies. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, they become those things where like you carry them around for years and you're like, should I finally take this to like Goodwill this year, or should I keep it in my shed for another year? Because maybe. I'll need one of those oil barometric pressure things, and my son will be very impressed by it when he exists. And, uh, and, and you know, my daughter will ask how it works, and probably what will happen is my dog will just break it, and then I'll have to, it'll stain the, the, the floor, and I'll be worried because I rent this place, and I'm going to get my <laughs> deposit back. Uh, but, you know, money would be cooler. Uh, so, like, it, it really is, you know, it's, it's both from this, like, abstract principle basis. Like, obviously, that misalignment isn't going to work long term, but then also from a purely tactical way, right? The reason that the business mm -hmm. side is compensated well when they're successful is because it works, right? That's how you like make the business grow better. So it is worth thinking about like how would we make our IT people equally infused uh, with, with passion about it. And, and we're, we're not talking about equally paying everyone, right? We're talking about it being equitable. We're talking about figuring out what's That's important, right. Who's helping with the success of the business and rewarding them accordingly, right? Yeah. This this isn't uh, yeah, yeah. pay everyone the same. Yeah, and and definitely like all of the um, all of the wonderful soft benefits that you'll read about in DevOps reports and things are cool as well. But I always like to warn people, right? The only people who tell you that the thing that matters the least is money usually are the people who don't want to give you money. So don't <laughs> don't listen to that advice. That's bad bad advice about uh, thinking about how you compensate people. 
so I think uh, the 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 final thing, which is uh, a bit of a bit of a, a cause and an effect and a catch-all, like all of these things, which become swirling vortex vortexes where the uh, causation cycle uh, misses out. But I think the other critical thing that uh, causes a bottleneck is basically mistrust between IT and the entire rest of the organization. I mean, I don't know, maybe the people who, uh, who make sure that the, well, even the people, facilities people who have to replace the chairs, like, have you ever gotten new chairs at your office? And immediately you're like, what are these facilities people doing, right? Like I had my old favorite chair here. And so basically very few people like IT. I, I, sorry. And IT likes very few people. I mean, yes, let's yes. not put this on the, let's, let, let's some, some of the right, arrogance right, right. comes from and, our and, side, yeah. And, and I, think, I think way back when, this wasn't necessarily the case because b way back in the old days of you know short sleeve shirts and pocket protectors, like IT was seen as a critical enabler of how business was running. Sorry, I just said enabler there, but <laughs> uh, but like a critical component of how the business was going to differentiate and run effectively. But somewhere, and I think this is the vicious cycle: is over time, for all many of the structural reasons we've talked about, and also just the the nature of IT in general. Like you kind of see, I, I've collected together, this is, uh, if you know the Standish group, they're the, uh, the most depressing analysts in our industry. <laughs> they basically track the success and therefore also failure of IT projects. Um, and I collected together all the data I could find without actually paying them money, um, which is what the internet's good for. But you can see over the past uh, 20, 25 years or so, uh, to roughly estimate, that not only, so the green is successful projects, not only has the green been low, but what I find about uh, a range like this even more um, interesting slash uh, depressing is it hasn't changed, right? So we haven't really improved uh, very much. I'm not really sure what was happening in like 2006 and, and these other years. But, um, but I think this is a good representation of how there is reason to have mistrust between IT and the business, right? Like the projects haven't been successfully delivered. However, if you were to turn this around and ask IT people, as, as Standish and other people do, why did these projects fail? What IT people tend to say is like, well, because they kept changing the requirements, or because we didn't get proper funding, or like, we tried to do exactly what they told us to do, and then we met with them in 12 months, and they said like, who asked you to do this, right? <laughs> and so like, and again, it's this vicious cycle that goes back and forth that results in this state of affairs that really just makes it easy uh, for, for people to mistrust each other. So uh, I think, you know, getting a bit to uh, kind of summing up a bit of the prescriptive um, cures or, or ways of helping things, um, you know, I think it's always, it's always dangerous to uh, describe facts about things I know very little about, but I guess I've made a career about, out of it. <laughs> um, but, you know, when talking through this, I think, uh, like, these are, these are the tools that I think leadership has, people who are running companies to uh, essentially work with, to change this, right? Because if you, if you think of the things we've gone over, finance, compensation, uh, kind of structural mistrust uh, between the organizations, um, it really does take someone in an executive leadership position to change those things, right? Like we on a product team, I say we like I do anything. I, Rick and I were on a product team for these slides, and so we can make changes. <laughs> but it's not like I change pixels on a screen. Um, you all on a product team, uh, like you can decide what goes on in your own domain, but it's not like you can change a 20,000 person organization, right? Like that doesn't, you can't stick that in your build pipeline. So it really is the executive team uh, that has the ability to change things. And I think these, we'll kind of walk through these, but I think these are the, not only the three tools that, that senior leaders have, but I think they're the only three tools that they have. And I realize that we kind of neglected to mention what we think the fixes are for the mistrust. We, we did. Which we should probably go over. That's a good example of, of something that leadership can do on point three here. Mm -hmm. You, you want to give them an idea of that? The, the yes, yes, yeah. So um, we totally did miss that. Yes. So the, any kind of mistrust is usually from prejudice, and exposure is the only way, right? The, if, if, if you don't like this, this business guy because he wears a tie every day and you've decided that he doesn't know what he's talking about, and that, that's prejudice. And I've seen that. I've seen entire technology teams not like someone because he wore a tie every day. He wore a tie because he used to work at a bank and he was very comfortable with it. He was also incredibly skilled. So they wrote off someone who was incredibly skilled 
based on, on, on a bias like that. So it is extremely important to start pushing people together and make sure that they have exposure. Once we understand each other's problems, it's a lot easier to, to, to try to help each other fix them. Yeah. I mean, that, that is, so when I've had to do this in the past, when I've had to try to bring these groups together, I did road shows, I did, I did everything I could to try to bring technologists and business people together. And it, it's, it's a long, slow, difficult thing to, to do, but it, it's possible. And I, I think, you know, that, that gets to the, uh, the third part, the organization mm -hmm. structure, right? Where, um, I th again, I think, I think, so if you think of, of company leadership as the programmers of the organization, right, to, uh, I mean, as any technologist, you think the only way to solve a problem is with more technology. So we'll apply <laughs> our, our frame of mind to, uh, to people outside of the tech world. But if you think of them as programmers of an organization, uh, one of the things to, to Rick's point that they can do is identify this problem that, um, so if we have, we have the, the, the developers, the product team, and we have our, the, the line of business people, and both of them don't like each other, right? Like when, when we were talking over this example, I was thinking of how many times, even at tech companies, I've seen the thing where uh, a business executive comes and uh, someone last minute gives them a t-shirt and they pull it over their button up shirt. And you're just like, I, I know who you are, right? Like you're, you're the guy who pulled the t-shirt over a button up shirt, which, uh, just as a tip, if anyone's listening, not a good look. Just find a bathroom, <laughs> put the T-shirt on. Um, uh, anyways, like so, you know, you you identify these these cultures that don't mix together. So one of the things you can do is you can actually change that, right? Because that's one of one of the the three things you can actually do. You can say, all right, uh, we are going to not only do we have a product team of designers and product managers and developers. But maybe that product manager is someone from the business side that we're going to bring over and put in that product team, which you see over and over again, right? And um, I was just talking with someone uh, last night at a, at a large retailer, and they were one of these people who had come over from the business in to, to do product management type of things in IT. And what they were saying, they said, among many other things, one of the things that they, I was hoping that they would say that they did say, which is an odd sentence, but that they said was, um, one of the reasons that I came over to do this is because I had no idea, they didn't put it this way, I had no idea what was going on. So when people would explain to me processes that they were doing and how, what they had to go through to do stuff, I could say like, well, I don't, I don't you know, I'm a, I'm a you know, country lawyer. I don't know anything <laughs> about your big fancy city stuff, but that sounds really stupid, right? Like, why would you like wait three months to get a server when you should just get it? Right. And so there's a huge amount of advantage that you can have when structurally you can move people over and you could think about going the other direction. Right. But merging these two groups together, exposing them to each other definitely is something that you can do with organizational change. And I think there's three patterns that, that we've seen. There's probably more, but one and it's kind of an obvious combination of things. But there is the pattern of moving IT people into the business. Uh, embedding them in the business, and you can imagine what the second one is, uh, and that is moving business people into the I, the IT group, right? However, the, another very popular pattern is to start up a whole different product group, and this, you know, if you really want to distract yourself and and relive memory lane, you can talk about bimodal and IT, and that's supposed to be bad. And now I've committed some sort of verbal sin, but <laughs> whatever. We we'll we talk about that later when I'm not here. Uh, but you know, it, you do really see these organizations where they move both into this new organization and they have lots of pale wood so they're successful uh, and they set up a new way of doing things. But again, that is something that a leader can do that's very hard for individuals to do. That, you know, I think there's an anti-pattern too. Um, I assume some of you have seen the movie Office Space, um, which I, takes place here in Austin, right? That's right. Um, there is someone in that movie whose entire job is to take this, the, the software specifications and the requirements from the business to the developers, right? Right, a real people person. Yeah, so, so putting someone in between because you know, developers can't talk to the business, that is a pattern that I see. And that, that actually just makes things worse. Exactly. So that, that doesn't bring people together, that doesn't help. I think maybe learning some social, social skills and giving up on your, your prejudices works a little bit better. That's right. <laughs> yeah, well, well, sometimes it's good just to wear a t-shirt without a button-up shirt. Sometimes you should wear closed toe shoes. That, yeah. work, that works too. <laughs> uh, um, and then I, th I think we covered the, the second one to go in reverse order, the, the finance and funding pretty well. But again, uh, we like to list that because that's another area where like uh, us, it's not like the, even the senior vice president of application development can change how the whole organization does its financial planning cycle, right? Like as awesome as their software might be. 
uh, or I shouldn't say their, their organization software. <laughs> but that's another thing that if you're in a leadership position at a company, that is your responsibility. If you want to transform the organization, you need to start working on that. And uh, you're one of the only people who can actually change that. And then finally, uh, going in reverse order, we haven't spoken that much about vision and strategy. Um, and surprisingly, when I've talked about this with Rick, he hasn't made fun of it. Most people make fun of this word vision and strategy. But I think, I think the point of that being that another thing that the leadership in a company can do, this is the only tool they have. And they have to, uh, instead of making people ro roll their eyes about what the vision and strategy is, they need to spend an extremely long amount of time. I guess the amount of time doesn't matter. They need to make sure they have a very concise, almost prescriptive vision that they, they operate on, but then also have a strategy function that matches with the capabilities they have. So what do I mean by uh, a, vis a crisp vision? Well, first of all, uh, you probably have, have had visions like this. Or, I have visions all the time. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, worked at companies that have visions that are sort of like, you know, uh, this is the bad version. We're like, our, our, our mission is to excel in our market and achieving uh, a leading position that allows us to engage with our employees and our community effectively for the greater good and increase shareholder value, which is like I always suggest, you know what you should look into? Check cashing. Aside from that part in the middle, like, is you going to increase shareholder value really easily if, if that's really what you're serious about? Yeah, like, it's like 300%, 400% return on your money. Yeah, and, and so <laughs> now, now in contrast, there's, um, there's another uh, great pivotal customer. There's a couple of them running around here at the conference, uh, DBS in Singapore. And they have, so far, the favorite vision that I've come across. And it's, it's a, sort of a longer thing, but at the core of it, what it says is, our, our vision is we want our customers to live more and bank less, right? And so they're a bank. And basically what they're saying is we want to interact with our customers less, right? Like we don't really need them to worry about banking so much. And so what this means is that all the way up to the, the CEO level and hopefully the board level, uh, but the CEO level down to an individual like you all or us who like is sitting there thinking about how should I code this? Like what... Should I spend the time to make this interface easier to use or spend the time to do something else, right? And if you know what that vision is, you know that your priority is to make it as easy as possible for the end users to just go about their banking business so they can leave, right? Because, you know, maybe you're not like me, but it's not like after this, I'm going to go log into my banking system and just sort of hang out with it right and see what's going on like I like to go into the app store and read through the change notes on things because I used to be a developer so I don't mind hanging out there but I don't go and be like ah oh, yes that bill was paid at 3 37 a.m. and you see this one was sent at 3 45 a.m. fascinating let, let me let me investigate what's going on here like I don't want to do any of that um, and so I think coming up with a vision like that that can direct like the day-to-day -day, almost hour by hour activities again, is something that only the senior leadership at a company can really do, but right? To, to expand on that, one of the things that, um, that I see all the time is there is a company going through digital transformation, and the only reason they have is that CIO Magazine said to do that. Like, there's, it's not tied to any business thing. They don't, their goal is to transform, not to transform so they can meet their vision, right? right. So it's, it's very, very lacking. And, and when you don't have, it's like getting in the car for a Sunday drive and nowhere to go rather than taking a trip somewhere, right? At the end of the day, there has to be a destination. And if you don't know that destination, if you haven't defined it, you're just going to drive in circles, which might be fun uh, in your car, but n not in your business. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, next thing you know, it circles down a, down a drain uh, that you found in the app. Uh, anyways, um, yeah, and I, and I think I think just... You know, I, th I think summing up one thing, a tool that's not here, but a mindset of going about this. And again, following this principle of like programmers figure the way to solve any problem is to make people programmers, which if you think about it, that's what we've done since the days of XP, right? You're like, ah, oh, QA is a problem. We'll make them programmers. And then you're like, operations people are a, pro a problem. We'll make them programmers. And then maybe even these designers, we might make them programmers and on and on and on. We'll catch the business analyst and turn them into like product managers who know what a backlog is and they're kind of program. Anyways. Uh, applying that principle. Um, I think what, what's good for leadership to think about what they're doing, again, is how they're programming the organization, right? And what's the best way, just to blanket state it, like the best way to go about figuring out how to program something, and that is following this fast feedback cycle, a small batch cycle or a, an MVP cycle. And that means that what leadership should do as they reprogram the organization is like try things, 
like come up with theories of what might work and they might be wrong, right? Like it might be the wrong idea to move the business people into IT and you might try that for three or six months and that is, doesn't work out well. Um, and, and instead what you should do is that means you should try moving it over. But what you don't want to do is get stuck in like, oh, we're going to do this for three years because that's what we could get budget for and it matches the business case. And so we're going to set up this organization where uh, despite what we know after seven months that this is kind of rocky, sure, we're going to figure it out, right? Like you constantly want to be experimenting and improving at, at how well your organization structure is, how you're doing these other things. Um, well, and, that, and that means you shouldn't canonize what you're doing, right? right, right. So th another problem that we see sometimes is that they, they, someone has come in and said, this is the Spotify model. And so they're trying that. And if they fail at it, they just think they're not trying hard enough. So they, they, they pray to the gods of Agile, and they hope that they get a better result. But it's not a religion, right? What, what works in your culture, what works in your business is going to be different, and you have to be flexible. Absolutely. So that's, uh, I guess you could call that a readout of, of our, our uh, research and thinking so far. This is us. I guess I could have gotten a better picture. Wow, that's it. great. Yeah. But it's very I trendy. Should, you know, I think it's, I look younger. It's the pixel art version. <laughs> um, but uh, if, if you want to if you want to uh, follow us on Twitter, which is the only reason anyone ever public speaks, just so that you know, for the other speakers, is so that they get more Twitter followers. Uh, so that's the only feedback that we need is that there's increases there. Uh, however, also like uh, we have a we have a podcast that that we do around this topic where we kind of sort through these ideas. And there's a, there's a book that I started working on that, that if I do my job will be out around January or so. Um, but if you go down there to cote.io slash bottleneck. Uh, I think I spelled that right. Um, you can get a list of all of those things to kind of like uh, delve into it more. And I think we have uh, a, a little bit of time for questions, which it's nice presenting with someone because usually I talk so long that there's no time for questions. So uh, <laughs> hopefully you benefit. Um, I think uh, if you can reduce your size down to this, you can come <laughs> up here uh, and ask questions. But uh, we'll, we'll open it up for anyone who uh, has any inquiries or leave early if not. Which I always enjoy that in meetings when they end early. All right. No <laughs> questions? Good. Stupefaction is top KPI for me on, on a talk. Oh, over there. I failed. Okay. That's too top down. You probably got, you've got, I mean, in my opinion, I think this is done wrong quite often, but the vision should be very high level if it comes from the top. And then, it, you know, people should in the organization should be able to add to it, right? Yeah. In the end, everyone should be thinking about the business and the, and the products that, that they're developing. Um, but yeah, that's, I, I see that. And that is almost always a very, very top down where the, the CIO or the CTO or someone or the CEO sets the vision and it is, canonized it is it is the official vision forever and it's so specific that they can that is a problem um, that's another thing you, you need to fix and you fix that by transforming yeah and I, and I think to, to add more to that I think there is well one most visions that companies set are terrible right like they're not effective they sound cool usually but they just like are a, a bad tool like like if I if I may digress like why do flathead screwdrivers exist Philip's so much more superior, and yet this, this flat vision persists for some reason. Uh, anyways, so going back to the main talk here. Um, so yes, most of them are bad. But I think, I think another thing is, one, um, companies can change their vision, right? They can be open to changing it around. And even though it's supposed to be clear and concise, I think it is reasonable to say, especially for gigantic, huge conglomerate companies, they might have separate visions underneath them. And, and also to be honest, right? Like if you're, if you're one of these conglomerate companies uh, and you own like all these unrelated businesses, I mean, your vision is like uh, hedging your investment over a portfolio of assets, right? Like no one needs to know that vision except the people who own it all. And each individual uh, organization should have their own vision, but you don't need to have some sort of like, you know, we're a gigantic global conglomerate and we're trying to improve the world is our vision. And you're like, I don't, know what that is. All you're trying to do is hedge out your investments over, you know, 50 years. Totally cool. Uh, but it's, I think, I think you can tailor visions down to, to units um, that you have. 
but then also being open to evolving it, I think, uh, is important as well. Like that, that DBS one is, is a relatively new vision that they have. Um, and I see other organizations uh, transforming theirs as round as well. Is that, is that helpful? <laughs> as helpful as possible. <laughs> yeah. And anyone else? All right, well, great. Well, thanks for coming to the talk. Uh, we really well, appreciate you. it. And uh, enjoy the rest of your week. <laughs>